Today's episode deals with themes of depression and suicide. If you or someone you know is struggling with suicidal thoughts and depression, please contact the Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255 or text HOME to the crisis text line at 741741. Welcome to episode number 18 of the Castle of Spirits podcast, brought to you by castleofspirits.com, the home of 4,600 and growing true reader and listener submitted ghost and paranormal stories. That is a fact. Good. (laughs) And Vince, as a matter of fact, today's episode is about haunted Hollywood. Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been there? I have. I have, in fact. I've been there. Were you famous? I was not famous. Were you in movies? I were not in movies. Mm. Um, However, I have. You've seen a movie from Hollywood. Seen a movie. Very good. Made in Hollywood. Quite a few, actually. Mm. But one thing on a serious note, if, if, if I make it serious right now. Yes. There's a certain allure to Hollywood. Tinsel town, mm-hmm. as they call it. Mm-hmm. It pulls people in. It's a land of dreams mm-hmm. where people go, seek out their fortunes, their fame and glory. And most of the time, those dreams die a sad death. And, you know, I think that most of the stories we're going to share today are about such kind of squashed or early snuffed out dreams. Well, and that's the reason why I think it's a really powerful topic, because there are very few places in the world that I can think of where there's a sort of nexus of all these people bringing their lifelong hopes and dreams and aspirations. Yeah. Emphasis on dreams. Yeah. And when you've got that kind of energy, it can lead to very depressive, dangerous places for people. Yeah. And it's a tragedy. And you would think that that that's got to leave some kind of a like a psychic scar on the the area. And that's why Hollywood is The City of Broken Dreams. That's right. So we are going to cover a few stories today. Uh, One of them, we'll just put out there now. We'll get to it a little bit later. One of them, we are going to talk about a famous ghost, ghostly figure that showed up in a very popular big budget movie. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. What is it? We are going to talk about the three men and a baby ghost. Is it real? Is it fake? Who knows? We know. Do you know? We're going to tell you all about it. So you're basically saying that one of these dreamers Mm -hmm. may have left an imprint. On celluloid. But we're not going to talk about that now? We're not going to talk about it right now. We'll get to it. We're going to leave them hanging. Yeah, we're going to leave you guys hanging. Uh, So in this episode, what we have done is that we have each brought two Famous or Mm semi-famous tales of hauntings or or some such thing. Paranormal activity. So we flipped a coin earlier and Jane was on the winning side of that coin flip. (laughs) And so were you, audience. All right. So I'm going to start off with the story of Peg and Twistle and the haunted Hollywood sign. Oh, Mm -hmm. I know the story. I've heard of it. So Peg and Whistle, she was born Millicent Lillian and Whistle, and Peg was just a nickname. She was born February 5th of 1908 in Port Talbot, Glamorgan. I probably mispronounced that. Wales. Oh, and so she was not American. No, her her parents were actually British, and she was born in Wales, and she grew up mostly in London. But then she and her father, after her parents got divorced, her father got custody of her and she and her father immigrated to new york in 1913 when peg was only five and her father was a stage actor and did some work on on and off broadway and then he was the victim of a hit and run accident uh in 1922 so sadly he died and peg was sent to live with her uncle in new york and her uncle he was like managing a, a 
guy as a stage actor. And so, you know, her father had been an actor and now she's living in New York with a guy who manages an actor. So it was only natural that she, you know, joined the theater. So by 1925, when she was 17, yeah, 17, she was enjoying some success both on and off Broadway. Um, she lived in Boston and New York and and did actually quite a bit. She was in a stage production of Hamlet with Ethel Barrymore. So like she was doing some some big name things. Oh, wow. So I didn't know that she had actually gotten some sense of yeah. or some taste of success. Yes. That's interesting. So much so that even a young Betty Davis was in the audience during a uh, production of uh, Henrik Ibsen's The Wild Duck that Entwistle was in. She played a character named Hedvig. And after the play, uh, Betty Davis said to her mother, I want to be exactly like Peg Entwistle. Really? Yeah. And then Betty Davis would go on to play Hedvig in... Uh, was it called? The Wild Duck. And she always credited Peg Entwistle as being her inspiration for getting into acting. Well, that's really interesting because right? ha- knowing a little bit about the Peg Entwistle story, I just had always assumed that she was so- sort of like a a successless person. Right. Yeah, that's kind of how it, it always sounds when you just look at the surface of the story. But, you know, she moved to L.A. in... 31, 32, some, somewhere around there. And um, right after she got to L.A., she got into a, a big play in L.A. with Humphrey Bogart. And it was a, it was a really popular, well-received play. So, yeah, she actually had quite a bit of success. But from what I understand, she moved to L.A. to get into film because it was right around the time that the talkies – as they called them, were becoming popular, that the the silent era was kind of going away. So a lot of stage actors were flocking to L.A. to try and get into movies because they had these, you know, voices that they had really, you know, honed for stage. So they figured this would be a boon for the new talkies. So she gets to L.A., but everybody else is there, too, for the same reason. So she kind of starts getting lost and she's she's not she doesn't stand out from everyone else in LA. So in 1932, she was actually cast in her only film credit ever. The only film credit she would ever get and it was in a film called 13 Women. Now this movie was based on a book that dealt with some pretty taboo themes for the day, including uh, suicide, murder, and lesbianism. And the character that she played in the book was a lesbian. In the movie, it seems like they toned that down. But in test screenings, the movie was really not well received. And most of her uh, most of her part ended up being cut from the film altogether. She ended up having something like two minutes, four minutes in the entire movie. And some say that this was enough to, you know, send her spiraling. It, I feel like there was a lot more to her story than that. She she had been married. She got married in New York and then found out that her husband had lied to her that he actually had another family on the side with a child. And apparently he was both physically and emotionally cruel. I saw the word cruel to her. So some think that there was some PTSD from, you know, what she went through with her husband and then losing her mother and then her father being killed. So it's kind of, uh, this has been historically a disservice to her to say that, mm-hmm. oh, she didn't make it in the business. Right. So- yeah. Well, and you're, and you're going to tell us exactly. what came that, as a result. I mean, that's, yeah, that's what it sounds like. When you see, again, the kind of the surface story, she was a starlet, come to Hollywood, didn't make it, 86 herself because she was so sad, you know. But it sounds to me like there was a lot more to it. And I kind of feel like 
I don't even feel like she probably even knew that her character was being almost completely removed from the movie. And the reason I say that is because the movie wasn't even released until like three years after her death. So I find it hard to believe that, you know, 10 minutes of a 14 minute character gets cut out and, and she, you know, kills herself over that. I think there was a lot more to her story than that. But she did, she did commit suicide. Right. So on Friday, September 16th of 1932, she told her uncle that she was going to a nearby drugstore to meet with some friends and she never returned. Her uncle never saw her again. And the next day, some sources say the next day, some sources say two days later, that the dates get a little weird here. But a day or two later, a woman hiking up near the Hollywood sign finds a woman's shoe, a jacket, and a purse. The woman, the hiker, picks up the purse and looks inside it, presumably to see who it belonged to, and found a suicide note that said, I am afraid. I am a coward. I am sorry for everything. If I had done this a long time ago, it would have saved a lot of pain. P-E. So just the initials P-E. So she, she gets this and she looks down the hill And about 100 feet or so below where she's standing, she sees a woman's body. She goes into town. She tells the police. She gives them the things that she found. And the police come up. They they can't identify her. They don't know who she is. And then they run an article in the paper about this woman who died up by the Hollywood sign and include the the content of the note her uncle sees this knows peg hasn't been seen for a couple of days this note is signed pe so he identifies the body and it's peg so what they believe happened is that after she left her uncle's house some say she was drunk or otherwise inebriated that she hiked up to the hollywood sign they lived fairly nearby She hiked up to the Hollywood sign and used a kind of a workman's ladder on the back of the letter and climbed up to the top of the H and jumped off. Wow. Yeah. Really, really sad. It's a, it's a really, really sad story, but it wasn't, it wasn't right away that kind of the hauntings either started or were noticed or were associated with her in the 1940s, the H from the Hollywood sign fell down for some reason. It was a storm or something. Apparently it was in disrepair. It had kind of been abandoned. And so the H fell down and a lot of people started attributing that to Peg saying, you know, that's where she jumped. This is her spirit, you know, (laughs) kind of destroying the sign or, or whatever, making herself known in some way. Uh, And ever since then, people claim to see the spirit of a woman dressed in white 1930s type attire up in the area. Everyone from park rangers who work up there see her regularly, hikers. Uh, One of them is that a couple in the 1990s was hiking in the mountains and they saw a woman dressed in the white 1930s attire. And she just kind of appeared out of nowhere. They had kind of a creepy feeling about seeing her. And she was kind of coming toward them and then just disappeared. So in the middle of, you know, broad daylight, this woman just appears in old attire and then disappears right before their eyes. So they were obviously pretty creeped out. And then in 2013 or so, there was a woman hiking, and she was suddenly overwhelmed with the scent of gardenia, which was apparently Peg's favorite perfume, and she wore it quite a bit. So she's overwhelmed by this scent and has this sneeze attack because of it. When she's done sneezing, she spots this woman in, again, in the white 1930s style clothing, And 
the the woman is coming toward her and the hiker just has this really awful feeling about it. So she turns and runs the other way and, you know, gets out of there. But my very favorite story, this one I think is the creepiest. It takes place in the 80s. There were some students, high school, college age in that area. They were up there at night and apparently access to the sign itself is is pretty restricted. It's fenced off. You can't just walk up to it anymore. So they're up there after dark and they sneak through the fence and they go right up to the sign and they're just kind of hanging out and looking around. And as they're walking on the trail, it sounded to me like they were kind of goofing off. One of the boys falls off the trail down the side of the mountain. But it's it's not so far that he's injured. He, you know, he has to kind of scramble back up the hill. He gets back up to the top of the hill and they are walking back to the fence, you know, to leave. It's about midnight. And as they're walking, they see this woman in Again, white 1930s attire. They said that she had a veil over her face and she's wearing heels, like high heels. And she's coming up the hillside toward them. And this kid had just tried to like, you know, climb up the hillside and and was kind of having a hard time of it. She's walking effortlessly, almost like she's gliding up the hillside. So she's not going up like a trail. She's coming up the hillside. That's what it sounded like to me. Yeah. It didn't specifically say trail. It sounded to me like she was coming up the hillside, basically from where this kid had just fallen. And she's just gliding like right up to them. And they freak out and they run. And she's apparently chasing them. Like she's on them the whole time. And you know how these stories are. That's just kind of where it ends. You, you don't know. Well, did she stop when they got to the fence or, you know, whatever. But isn't this the one that was featured on like an Unsolved Mysteries or? It was something like that. I remember seeing a recreation of it. Yeah. One of those multitudinous haunting shows. True. So I really like the Peg and Whistle story for for several reasons. I think that it's a very human story. You know, it's. I think that most of us can identify with her in some way, whether or not it's, you know, about becoming a a film star or whatever. I think that, you know, having a dream and rough experiences and, you know, and how they can change your perception of life. And it's easy to empathize with her. And who doesn't love, love a ghost in period? clothing, you know, creeping out hikers in the in the middle of the night and gliding up, gliding up <laughs> grassy, rocky hillsides. Like a bona fide wraith out there. Right, right. Yeah. And and there's something obviously very romantic about her story, you know. Wasn't there a coda to that story that stated a day or two after oh, yeah. she died? She received some sort of a telegram yeah. or something. Yeah. Well, there is a there is a story that RKO Pictures, who she was contracted with, and then they they didn't renew her contract, and a lot of people point to that as one of her reasons for killing herself as well. That a few days after she died, a letter was delivered to her uncle's house where she was living, and it offered her a part in a movie of a woman who commits suicide at the end. I did read that a boy who lived in the house at the time, he was young. I don't know if he was a, she had a couple half brothers. So I don't know if it was one of them or what said that he remembered that yes, a letter had come, but he didn't know the content of it, but that his uncle was really angry at RKO and called them and basically yelled at them for sending a letter to offer her the role rather than just telephoning because it took several days for the letter to get there where if they had just phone called the day they sent the letter instead, maybe she wouldn't have committed suicide. Wow. So yeah, ironic and just heartbreaking, heartbreakingly sad. 
It's also got to be heartbreaking for the person who decided to send the letter instead of calling. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did that make them feel? Yeah. But that is the tragic story of Peg Peg Entwistle, who is now known as the Hollywood sign ghost. What would that be like to seek your fame and fortune? And find it in that way. And find it by becoming essentially the most famous ghost. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't think I I don't think most people would like that. I don't yeah, I don't think Peg would have liked it. So, you know, it's hard to tell her story, but I feel like keep it respectful, which I she absolutely deserves, you know. It's you don't want to I don't want to just be like, "Oh, this lady jumped and now she's a ghost." You know, I think that her story deserves to be told just as much or more than the story of the sightings of the ghost that's supposed to be her. So she was a lot more than just, just a haunting. She was gorgeous. Have you seen pictures of her? I think so. I feel like she kind of looks like a really young Blythe Danner. And Blythe Danner was smoking when she was young. Blythe Danner's still pretty gorgeous. True. Anyway, so enough about my story. Uh, Vince, you have a story you want to tell the folks? Speaking of, Gorgeous corpses. There was a young man who once said, live fast, die young, leave a beautiful corpse. Ooh, who was that young man? It was James Dean. Unfortunately, he did not leave a beautiful corpse because he died in a car accident at the age of 24. I think a lot Mm. of people know the story of James Dean. He occupies one of three key spots in like the holy trinity of 20th century pop culture icons, Mm -hmm. especially from like the 50s and 60s. -hmm. The other two being Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley. Mm-hmm. There's innumerable innumerable posters and images of the three of them hanging out the together. Trifecta. Even, even though they didn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It's like the, the, the 50s era trifecta mm-hmm. of Hollywood glitz, glitz and, and glamour, glamour and beauty. <laughs> All that said, the fame that he did achieve, it was quite an accomplishment considering that he only did, he only starred in three movies before he died. Mm. And actually, two of them hadn't even been released yet. Oh, I thought only one of them. I didn't realize two of them. Yeah, he wow. did East of Eden, came out in 55, I mean, in 54. He had just finished filming Giant, and the one in between, Rebel Without a Cause, came out in October of 1955, while James Dean died on September 30th, 1955. Oh, wow. Again, he was only 24. This story that I'm going to tell here is about James Dean's Little Bastard. What? That was the name of the race car that he was killed in. A very interesting name indeed. And quite racy for the time. (laughs) Get it? Race car? So James Dean, aside from being a boss actor, he loved racing cars. And he was, he had, he had won a couple of, uh, and placed in a couple of races. I know that during the filming of Giant, he was contractually forbidden from getting anywhere near a moving vehicle that he would be piloting because mm. they said we can't afford to for this guy to get killed or seriously injured while we're making this big giant epic motion picture. So when filming wrapped in September of 1955, he purchased a Porsche 550 Spider, a very small, very mm. sleek, very fast new vehicle. And he was, you know, scheduled to to take part in a race that was happening in Salinas at the beginning of October. One week before he was killed behind the wheel, he met up with actor Alec Guinness, Mm -hmm. Sir Alec Guinness, who basically had a premonition upon laying eyes on the car. Guinness wrote in his book, the sports car looked sinister to me. And I heard myself saying in a voice I could hardly recognize as my own quote, please never get in it. If you get in that car, you will be found dead in it by this time next week. Wow. That was one week to the day before James Dean was killed. Wow. But I just want to say that it seems like so many people around him had this foresight that that this was going to be his demise. You know, the the movie studio having this contract that he couldn't, you know, drive cars like that, and then his friend, and it it seems like it was something that people knew this is going to happen. Well, and I think it also had to do with the fact that he he was a little reckless. You know, uh, I remember hearing in a documentary about James Dean, the actress Julie Harris, who was in East of Eden with him, she saw him 
driving up onto the set, speeding around. She told him, you know, you better, or she asked him, why do you drive so fast? And he said, I've got to, I'm not going to be around very long. Mm. Of course, that that's so, sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. But um, I think that James Dean had a, a bit of a an impacted view of life because his mother died so young herself. Mm. And so I think he felt maybe that he was never too far from it. Yeah. And, you know, we never are. But, right. But, you know, it's good to live your life <laughs> as if you'll die tomorrow. But, but safely. Plan, plan as if you'll live forever. Right, right. And that was another quote that I think was attributed to James Dean. I've seen it on posters. I'm not exactly sure he said that. So as I said, because this is not about James Dean's death so much, but just to get you up on it, he was to take place in the first annual Salinas Optimist Club road car sports races that were going to be held, that were held at the Salinas Municipal Airport on October 1st and 2nd, 1955. Um, originally, the car was going to be towed to Salinas from Los Angeles, but his mechanic whose name was Rolf Witherick, suggested that they should drive the car to break it in, to break the engine in, mm. and also to let James Dean get used to the car because it was that new to him. Wow. And so on the way to Salinas, uh, he got a speeding ticket for going 65 and a 55, which is something that- <laughs> What? You know, I do that constantly. I don't do that. Nope. Don't cop to anything. <laughs> Especially but when the law is not around. 65 and a 55? Scandal. Right. And I mention that because it sort of gives you an idea that he wasn't driving like a bat out of hell. Right. He may have been testing out the engine, that's right? That's speeding, but I wouldn't say that's reckless at all. And this happened on Highway 99, just south of Bakersfield at 3.30 p.m., roughly two hours before the accident. Mm. And I found out today there's actually a telephone pole along that route mm -hmm. that's been identified as a spot where he was pulled over and ticketed. Really? And on the phone pole... Somebody has stamped the letters J-D-L-D for James Dean's last drive. Wow. Or maybe delinquency. I don't know. He did get a ticket there. Um, at 5.45 p.m., just outside of Shalame, California, which is 120 miles from their destination, James Dean's car collided with a 1950 Ford Tudor driven by Donald Turnipseed, a 23-year-old Cal Poly student. Turnip seed was treated for a, a, a cut nose. Uh, James Dean's mechanic, Rolf Weatherwick, was actually thrown from the car and, and knocked unconscious. He survived mm. with some broken bones. But James Dean was taken to the hospital in Paso Robles, which was 30 miles away Whoa. and pronounced dead on arrival at 620. Mm. Um, you know, there were passersby who stopped to help. And there was one lady who was a nurse and she detected a faint pulse, but ultimately he died of a broken neck and, oh. you know, multiple injuries, uh, internal injuries. After his death, the car was declared a loss by the insurance company, of course. Mm -hmm. But then it was, the body was purchased by Dr. William as rich, and he bought it from a salvage yard for parts because he was also a part-time racer. So he dropped James Dean's Spider's engine into his own race car. Did he know? Oh, yes. He okay. knew this. And then he loaned some parts of the car to a fellow driver, also a doctor, Troy McHenry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they've taken the wreckage of James Dean's car, the little bastard. Mm-hmm. And they dropped some parts in the two separate race cars. Both men participated in the same race in Pomona in 1956, and both men crashed their cars in that race. Wow. Esrich survived, but McHenry did not. He lost control on the first lap, and he hit the only tree that was near the track, and he died. Wow. So from the very beginning, now you start seeing that there's an association of a curse mm -hmm. with James Dean's car. Mm -hmm. James Dean obviously being the first victim of it. Right. And now this guy McHenry being the next victim. Shortly after those accidents on the track, the wrecked body of James Dean's car was bought by a guy called George Barris, who called himself the King of Customs. Hmm. And his intent was to rebuild it. But he discovered that it was so bent out of shape and destroyed that it would be impossible. So he ultimately loaned the, the car to the LA chapter of the National Safety Council. And from 1957 to 59, the car was taken on tour. Hmm. 
to be shown at car shows, to be shown at like drive-in movie theaters. Like as a macabre sideshow, like come see the car that James Dean died in. Exactly. Wow. And, you know, I guess it was, you know, for the National Safety Council. So they were, I guess, in a way, using this really grisly sort of dark attraction mm -hmm. to, to show people, well, you have to be careful on the road. Or you're going to end up like James Dean. Exactly. But- you haven't touched on this yet. It, the car wreck was not his fault. Am I right? What happened was that, first of all, it was near dusk. Mm -hmm. And this car was small. And it yeah. was gray. And it was low to the ground. Mm -hmm. And it was coming maybe in excess of the speed limit, right? Because mm -hmm. he's now, at, I, I can imagine, he's trying to get to the destination. He's <laughs> got no headlights. Right. And he's been pulled over and lost some time. and Right. And this... This guy, Donald Turnipseed, he was, it was, it's the intersection there between, it was 466 and Highway 41 in that area was real. Nowadays, they've got like safety lights, flashing lights, but the nature of the intersection itself has not changed. And you have to cross over into oncoming traffic to take this exit. Mm. The exit is to the left. And that's where Donald Turn Turnipseed was going. And he apparently didn't see James Dean's car. I mean, he was practically invisible. Mm -hmm. He turned in front of him. He turned in front of him. According to the mechanic that was driving, riding with James Dean, he told him, hey, hey, slow down, you know, watch out. And James Dean's last words were, he'll stop, he sees us. Mm -hmm. And he tried to kind of gun the car in a, in a racing maneuver to get away from the guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, they ended up hitting almost head on. Mm -hmm. And ironically, Rolf Wetherick, the mechanic who was thrown from the car, died in a car accident about 15 years later himself. Wow. And Donald Turnips, he, he, he lived until, uh, I think he died in, in the 90s. Mm. So where are the parts of his car today? Do you know? Nobody knows. Really? But I'll get to that. I'll get to that shortly. Okay. There, as a side note, um, the actress Myla Nurmi, who was known as Vampira. She was actually mm. a friend of James Dean's. Mm -hmm. And in an interview from years and years ago where she was talking about her friendship with James Dean, she said that she saw the car on tour and there were people prying pieces off of the car, like <gasps> breaking pieces off. And, you know, one of her friends said, hey, you want a piece? And she was like, no, I don't want a piece of this car. Wow. And so this car, though, was being taken around the country and being displayed like that in a really kind of macabre mm -hmm. sort of a manner. But there were some incidents that leave, lead people to believe the car is somehow cursed. While the car was on tour in Sacramento, the car reportedly fell from its display and broke someone's hip. Oh, okay, wow. That's, you know, but that person was a lot luckier than a guy called George Barkas, who was the transport driver who brought the Porsche to a road safety expo and was allegedly killed when the car fell onto him. Oh no. Then in 1959, while it was in storage, the car mysteriously caught fire, but strangely it didn't spread. It was just contained to the car and not a whole lot of damage occurred. Two tires that were salvaged from the spider and sold by Barris, who now owned it, later blew out at the same time and nearly killed the driver. Oh my gosh. Wait, so, but all of this that you're telling me, like all the mishaps with this car, this is all in the 50s. And it ended in the year 1960 wow. when the car disappeared. Where was it last spotted? Sometime in 1960, while the car was being transported in a sealed box car from Miami to L.A., it said that it vanished without a trace, never to be seen again. The box car or the car from within? The car within. The box car was So empty. it never made it into the box car then? Either that or it, it vanished into the ether. I mean, you tell me. That's not how the ether works, Vince. No, oh, I don't know. I've never messed with it too much. In <laughs> 2005, there was a $1 million reward offered for the missing car. But to this day, no one has come forward. Probably because the person who stole is at the bottom of a ravine somewhere, you know, the, cur the, the final curse of the car. They tried to drive it away and to make their <laughs> riches from it, and look what happened. Yeah. I know that there's a couple of parts, pieces of the car um, that, uh, that are owned mm -hmm. legitimately, but the actual 
body of the car itself that was on display is just gone. Wow. Nobody knows where it is. And um, I mean, somebody knows where it is. Well, I certainly don't. Are you sure, Vince? Let and me if, s- turn your pockets out. Hey, if you're out there and you know anything about this, let us know. No, don't let us know. We don't want the curse. Just let somebody else know. Well, get get word to us somehow because I'd be very interested. So there you have Ooh, the curse of James Dean's little bastard car. That was a lot creepier than I expected it to be. Yeah, but but fortunately there are no reports of James Dean himself haunting the road or haunting studios. I've actually been to the intersection where James Dean was killed. There's mm-hmm. a monument uh, a quarter uh, a quarter mile or half a mile up the road mm-hmm. at a little restaurant and at a safe stopping point. Right. A little monument there. Maybe we should go sometime. Let's not drive, though. We could take James Dean's final drive. No, I don't want to do that. So now, what about you, Jane? Do you have yet another haunted Hollywood, cursed Hollywood story to share with us? Uh, I don't know if I would say cursed, but I do have a story that I I had heard of it, like, in passing, and actually a lot of the information I got for this ep- for this episode, for this um, story, I got from an episode of Celebrity Ghost Stories, which we had seen before. So I was peripherally familiar with this story. But uh, yeah, I've been I've been really excited to talk to you about this ever since I started researching it. So you don't even know what it is. Huh? Is it the Cecil Hotel? It is not the Cecil Hotel, but it is a domicile. This is the Pickfair Mansion. The what? The Pickfair Mansion. I don't know what that is. Yes. All right. So the Pickfair Mansion, it was this sprawling mansion, so many dozens of rooms, four stories, built on 18 acres. Uh, It was like this humongous, luxurious house. I think it was built in, some reports said 1918, some said 1920. It was built by, well, Douglas Fairbanks had it built for his wife, Mary Pickford. Hence, Pick Fair. I was going to ask, I I thought at first that that maybe you'd misspoken. I I was going to say, did you mean Pickford? Nope, Pick Fair. So uh, they kind of combined their names, which everybody's familiar with now, you know, like famous celebrity couples do that all the time. But really, the... Pickford Fairbanks couple were kind of the forefront of the Hollywood elite back then. They were so wait a minute, no kidding. They actually used to do things like that with the names, like well, they did it, like Brangelina. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of thing. In fact, uh, Lucille Ball said that they were doing that with their names, making Pickfair out of Pickford and Fairbanks. Uh, Lucille Ball credited them as giving her the idea to name their estate and then later their production company, Desilu. Desilu, that's right. Uh huh. Wow. So the Pickfords, the Pickford Fairbanks family had this massive, amazing house and they hosted huge, lavish parties there. And uh, Life magazine actually called Pickfair, which that wasn't the name of the mansion, was Pickfair. Quote, a gathering place only slightly less important than the White House and much more fun. Wow. (laughs) So, yeah, so they hosted these huge parties that were not only, you know, frequented by the Hollywood elite at the time, but also people like Albert Einstein, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Helen Keller, Charles Lindbergh, like everyone. If you were famous and you were alive then – Hopefully you got an invite to pick fair. The hauntings in the house actually started while they lived in the house. So it's not like it started after they died and, you know, now it's Douglas Fairbanks haunting the place. Did they build the house then? They did. So when Douglas Fairbanks bought the property, there was only like a small hunting lodge on it and they built this house It was apparently like the first house in Los Angeles, the first privately owned 
house in Los Angeles to have a swimming pool. And they had some all, all kinds of crazy stuff. If you get on the Wikipedia entry and read about it, it's, it's like, and it had this, and it had this, and it had this. And apparently my favorite feature that the house supposedly had ghost was a, a a running track below ground because apparently Douglas Fairbanks liked to no. jog in the nude so he had a a private below ground um yeah place where he could jog in the nude so uh, wow yeah you know those wacky wacky hollywood people so the haunting started a few years after they moved in, probably around the 1930s, early 1930s, and Mary said that she would hear these sounds in the attic that sounded like heavy footfalls. And she she said in a some interview at one point, she said, I am a sound sleeper, but I could not sleep under the noises which sounded like the tramping of heavy feet. I sat up in bed and addressed myself to the ghost. I wouldn't treat you this way, I said. It isn't ladylike. I don't expect to be treated in this manner. And the noises ceased. (laughs) Gentlemanly ghost. So she said that she never saw the ghost. She would just hear it. But other members of, uh, you know, their friends and family and like the staff would claim to see a ghost. So there's a story where... The a cook a cook ran out of the kitchen in a panic, and Mary says of this: One day, our cook, a practical, unemotional Swedish woman, ran out of the kitchen in terror, brandishing a knife. She declared she was being pursued by a strange, dark woman who she had seen in the kitchen. Interesting. So that gives me chills. And then a friend of Mary's was visiting the house and she had been upstairs and she she came running downstairs and said, I just saw a strange, tall, dark woman in the hallway up there. She was looking at the alcove. Her eyes wandered about in a puzzled way as she looked from side to side as if to say, something has changed here. At first, I thought she was Teresa, your maid. Then I saw she was a stranger. I went to speak to her. She vanished. Whoa. Mm Mm-hmm. So now Douglas Fairbanks, he claimed to not see anything. He didn't believe in ghosts. In fact, he's quoted as saying, I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe Pickfair is haunted, though Mary is sure of it. I'm sure there is some explanation, if we could find it, of the sounds we hear. Mm. So... He's saying of the sounds we hear. So he's hearing these sounds too. He's just, you know, pshawing. (laughs) What is that? Pshaw. And then Um, me in the meantime, running around under the house in the the nude, making his own little flapping sounds. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He's he's doing the slappy jog (laughs) in the basement. (laughs) The baby elephant jog. (laughs) A baby elephant jog. Baby elephant jog. Wow. Um, so anyway, a couple of the other types of ghosts that are reported to have been seen in the house, there was a ghostly woman in white, who we will get back to, and a man nearby the entrance of the house, and a ghost carrying sheet music. And I don't know anything else about the man or the ghost carrying sheet music, but honestly, a ghost carrying sheet music sounds Damn creepy to me. It's better than a ghost wearing a sheet. As I don't know. Often depicted. I, I'm a fan of the sheet. Yeah. Um, Casper. <laughs> uh, also, I can only find one source of this piece of information, which I will tell you what that source is in the next part of this story. But apparently there was a woman that Fairbanks was having an affair with who supposedly died on the property during one of the parties. That's all the information that I have on that. Uh, I couldn't find any details about that anywhere else other than the source. So 
Mary and Douglas, they divorced in 1936, and Mary lived in the home until she died in 1979. Then the house sat empty for a couple of years before it was purchased by L.A. Lakers owner Jeremy Buss. And he owned it for a few years, did a little remodeling, couldn't find any information on whether he and his family experienced any ghostly stuff or not. But then he sold it in 1988 to... Do you know who, Vince? Oh, I, I have no idea. To Piazzadora. Oh. Yes. So Piazzadora and her family, she was a, what, like a singer, dancer type person, right? Right. In the 80s. Yeah. And so- she was also, as I believe, as a child actress mm. in that awful abomination, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. Oh, no. That movie is horrendous. Let's not hold her accountable for that. No, no, no. Something that- There's that so even- much- <laughs> MST3K couldn't save. No. But go on, I digress. It's my least favorite MST3K episode, and it's not because of the bad, it's not because there's bad riffs, it's because it's a horrific movie. And that's the second show in a row where we've mentioned MST3K. Mm-hmm. Let's yeah. move on. <laughs> so, Piazzadora and her family moves into the house in 1988, and she says that the place was beautiful, it was perfect, it was a dream, it was everything they wanted in a house. And keep in mind, this is like an iconic house in Hollywood. Like, it's one of the most famous houses in Hollywood. It's it's a landmark. People love this house for so many reasons, okay? Just keep that in mind, because it's about to get a little painful here. So there's several stories that she tells on this Celebrity Ghost Stories episode where... Pia Zadora? Yeah. She's asleep. Her husband's out of town. He's out of town for the first six to eight weeks that they live in the house. So her and her two daughters, young, they're little, little kids, they're living in the house alone. And she's asleep. And suddenly she hears screaming and her two little girls come running into her room talking about, ooh, this gives me chills, talking about there was a very tall woman dressed in white with sunken eyes standing over their bed laughing at them. Oh, God. I know. (laughs) I have goosebumps. It creeps me out. There's nothing funny about it. To stand over your bed and laugh. No, There's not no with sunken eyes the sunken and being eyes. abnormally tall. Stop it. Enough with the laughing. That is not necessary. So she goes to the room with them and she's like, see, there's nothing here, blah, blah, blah. She's thinking, this is just nerves. They're little kids, brand new house, a humongous house, you know. So pretty soon the little girls, they get back to sleep. Uh, I don't think it was the same night. I think it was a little while later. Pia is in bed and she's laying there sleeping. She's got her eyes closed or she's just about to fall asleep and she starts hearing some sound. Is it a dog snoring? No, you can probably hear Freya snoring right next to me. There is no stopping her snoring. Sorry. Uh, She's hearing some kind of weird sound and she's terrified to open her eyes. She's like, I don't want to open my eyes. I don't want to know what this is. Eventually, she opens her eyes, and what does she see, Vince? Douglas Fairbanks <laughs> doing jumping jacks in the nude. <laughs> no, it's not that scary. It's the abnormally tall woman in white with sunken eyes standing at the foot of her bed laughing. Really? Yeah. And so this happens a few more times. They they get a priest to come in. He, like, blesses the house. Uh, what did we call that in the Amityville episode? They Catholiced up, got the got the priest out to do the the blessing, and for a little while it seems to have worked. Things are good, but her her girls are still afraid to sleep in their bed. So everybody piles into mom's bed. It's Pia and her two kids, like you do, like you do. And what happens in the middle of the night? Laughing, they're woken up. By the creepy, tall, laughing woman. Again, she says they didn't even stop to put on shoes. She gathered the girls up and they ran out of the house, got into the car and went and stayed at um, a hotel that night. But as they're leaving the house, 
She says that she closes the door behind her, and on the other side of the door, they can still hear the laughing. No. As they're fleeing the house. Yeah. What were you going to say? That's some Amityville stuff it's right there. It's bad. Yeah. I forgot what I was going to say. That just, that just... It gets worse. Oh, my God. I mean, the haunting doesn't get worse. So her and her husband, two years later, two years after buying the house, they decide that the only way to combat this ghost is to tear the house down and rebuild it. So what makes them think that tearing a house down and rebuilding it on the same property, it's not going to still be haunted? But they told everyone that they were tearing it down because it was infested with termites and that could not be handled. And apparently she stuck to that story until Celebrity Ghost Stories when she said, okay, okay, there were no termites. Really, the reason we tore it down was because it was haunted. That, oh, come on. People were so angry. Even Douglas Fairbanks Jr., he was like, why did they buy it if they were just going to tear it down? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this this Hollywood icon of a house was just torn down for a ghost. I, but that's kind of where the story stops. And I tried to do quite a bit of research, and I couldn't really find anything else. There's a YouTube video, which we'll include in the show notes, that says that it there's a, a like a Italian style villa mansion that's built there now and it's owned by some tech company. But there's no word of, I mean, I guess Pia's family rebuilt a house there. But I couldn't find any information on it or if that house was haunted or if the the villa that stands there now is haunted. I couldn't find anything like that. Just from the time that Pia's family tears the house down is kind of where all of the information stops. I have a theory. Okay. In our previous episode, number 17, we spoke about the Amityville horror. We also spoke about... Amityville 3, starring Patty Duke. I thought that was four. Oh, yeah. It's whatever. Four. four or five, maybe part 27, <laughs> I don't know, where there was a haunted lamp. Yeah. So what if there was something haunted in the house? What if they, mm-hmm. as part of the foundation of the house, they used some haunted piece of wood or something like that, right? That was part of the original structure and maybe something awful was attached to it by raising it. They just got rid of it. So I have a theory that I developed right at this very second while you were speaking. While I was doing research today, I watched a lot of YouTube videos. And one of the videos that I watched really just out of curiosity, I knew there wasn't going to be any information in there about haunting. It was an auction house, like an ad for an auction house they they called it a preview where they were kind of previewing some items from Mary Pickford's house from Pickfair. But I mean, Douglas Fairbanks died three years after they got divorced. And so she outlived him by like 40 years. So I think it's okay that we say it's Mary Pickford's house. Uh, they were pre- previewing things that they were going to be selling at auction that she owned. And she was this world traveler had been like everywhere and everywhere she went, she would get things. She had beautiful, you know, pieces of decor and furniture and and things like that from all over the world. So I wonder if in her travels, if she didn't pick up some kind of artifacts or, you know, mirrors or some, something that was potentially left in the house after she died and and by the time that uh, Pia Zadora and her family purchased the house, maybe this thing was still there. And that's where the haunting came from. And then when they leveled the house, they got rid of whatever it was. And, and now wherever that is, you know, people are experiencing this laughing woman and they're just like, well, I don't know where this ghost came from. <laughs> but anyway, that was my my pick fair. I was researching that most of today. I was really excited to share that one with you. Well, what I think you'll be excited about my story. Okay. Because my story also has to do with a very, very famous and much beloved home 
in Hollywood that was once occupied by a movie star. Tell me. There's an 1,100 square foot. Now, this is, this is in Hollywood, but this is small, right? There's an 1,100 square foot, two bed, two bath house in the hills above LA that was built in 1930 that once belonged to movie star Jean Harlow and her mm. husband, Paul Byrne, who was a movie producer. That's a really small house for, I would, I would picture someone like Jean Harlow in an 11,000 square foot house. Well, maybe she was just somebody who had good taste I and guess. not a lot of furniture. Yeah. The two were married in July of 1932, but within two months, Byrne was dead. Oh. A victim of a single gunshot wound to the head in their home. Oh. Byrne left behind a suicide note that read, Dearest dear, unfortunately, this is the only way to make good the frightful wrong I have done to you and to wipe out my abject humiliation. Mm. I love you, Paul. You understand that last night was only a comedy. Strange note. Very. According to the newspaper, and I quote, Burns nude body with a wound in the right temple and a thirty-eight caliber revolver from which a single shot had been fired, clutched in his right hand, was discovered at 11.45 a.m. in a dressing closet off his private bedroom in his rustic mountain home at 9820 Easton Drive, Benedict Canyon. Mm. Now, while his death was ruled a suicide, questions were raised almost immediately. When his body was found by the house staff, you, gotta, you have a staff of people in an a, a 1,100 <laughs> square like foot house. You're all like shouldering right? past each other in the hall. Excuse me. Yeah. Who's in the bathroom? <laughs> when his body was found, they didn't even call the police right away. What? But they instead called his fellow executives at MGM. No, that's not who you call. This gave birth to theories that Byrne was actually murdered and that his death was maybe covered up as a suicide whitewash. This kind of reminds, like, the... In order to save his his wife, Jean Harlow's movie career. The, the circumstances around his death and everything really reminds me of, uh, was it George Reeves? George Reeves, right? Yeah. Wow. One of the theories stated that the handwriting on the suicide note wasn't even his. Hmm. Another theory focused on the fact that his former common law wife, whose name was Dorothy Millette, she visited Byrne on the night that he died. Mm. And two days after his death, her body was found in the Sacramento River where she presumably had committed suicide. This led to rumors that Millette had killed Byrne. Wow. So tragedy upon tragedy, Mm -hmm. Jean Harlow herself died five years later at the age of 26. Really? I didn't know that she died that young. Now, fast forward to 1963. Let's do it. Oh, can I do the fast forward sound? Go ahead. But now you get serious here. Okay. It's 1963. The house was bought by a celebrity hairstylist named Jay Sebring. Oh, no. Who lived there until his own untimely death in 1969. As you, yep. as you may know, Sebring was the former boyfriend and the close friend of Sharon Tate. And he was at the Cielo Drive home on the night of the Manson murders. Mm-hmm. And he was murdered alongside Sharon Tate and the others that were there. Mm-hmm. Although their deaths didn't occur at the Gene Harlow house, there's a very creepy connection. Yeah. Not only the fact that he lived in the Gene Harlow house and he met an untimely fate, fate, but. Oh, I seriously have goosebumps everywhere. Right. In a 1970 article in a magazine called fate magazine, there was an article called Sharon Tate's preview of murder. Mm -hmm. And in that article, it was claimed that Sharon Tate told the interviewer about a disturbing occurrence that she'd had years or, ooh, I'm getting cold chills. The dream. I know this. That she'd had years earlier while she was staying at Sebring's house alone. Oh, I didn't know that's where she was when she had this dream. According to the article, Sharon Tate said she was awakened in the middle of the night by a strange little man in the bedroom. Mm. She freaked out. She took off down the stairs where she saw the figure of a murdered person tied to the stairs with their throat slashed. Yeah. And And although she couldn't tell whether or not it was a man or a woman, she got the impression that it was Jay Sebring that she was seeing murdered. Now, this was clearly a dream, but it was one that, you know, may have been a portent Mm -hmm. of she and Sebring's shared fate. Mm -hmm. Like Jean Harlow, 
Sharon Tate died at the age of 26. (gasps) So now the Jean Harlow house has not been reported to be haunted. Not too much anyway. Mm. It's been said, it's been claimed that over the years, uh, the ghost of Jean Harlow and Paul Byrne have been seen there, Mm -hmm. but nothing to do with Jay Sebring. Um, So again, in my case, there's not a lot of haunting as done by ghosts, but there is a lot of haunting as done by tragedy and possibly curses. Strange connections for sure. Yeah, the, the, that connection was really chilling, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I wasn't faking it when I said I, I got a cold chill as mm-hmm. I was as I was recount reading all of that. So that is the story of the Gene Harlow Paul Byrne cursed home. Wow, that was great. That was so good. And so, of course, well, now we wrap up by talking about the three men and a baby ghost. If you were alive in the eighties, nineties era, you probably at least know about the movie Three Men and a Baby. It was a huge blockbuster hit movie starring, uh, it was... uh, Steve Gutenberg. Steve Gutenberg and... uh, (laughs) Magnum P.I. Tom Selleck. Burt Reynolds. And Ted Danson. And long story short, they get gifted with a baby who belongs to one of them. And uh, now these three guys who live in this apartment in downtown New York City have to raise this baby. It's a warm and fuzzy comedy of errors. It is. Are there errors in the movie? I don't know. I don't think I even saw uh, it. You know, I haven't seen it since the 90s. Well, in the poster, the little baby pees all over his... uh... Yeah, all over Tom Selleck. And that apparently was real. The pee on the movie poster. And as Tom Selleck put it, that that P was more real than the ghost in the movie. So there's a ghost. So there's a ghost. In the movie. There's a scene about halfway through where Ted Danson's mom comes to meet the baby for the first time. She picks the baby up. And as she's walking away, you can see what appears to be the ghost of a little boy in the window, kind of hiding behind the curtains. And I remember seeing it when I was a kid and being freaked out. It's creepy looking. It straight up looks like a little boy hiding behind the curtains, peeking out like you can see his face, but it's blurry and it's indistinct and everything. So this is sort of given root to this strange theory about mm-hmm. this movie being haunted, being maybe haunted. like the movie set or something? Yeah. So people even went so far as to say that there was a boy who lived in the apartment where that scene was filmed and he had accidentally shot himself. Or I remember hearing that he jumped or fell out of the window. I didn't remember hearing that he had shot himself. But anyway, that a young boy had died in this apartment and... And then his parents like freaked out when his ghost showed up in the movie and they like sued Walt Disney to have that scene taken out of the movie and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But through the magic of movies, that scene was actually, nor were any of the other scenes, they were not filmed in an actual you know, whatever the scene was, they were all filmed on a soundstage in Toronto, Canada. Well, so, of course they, I mean, this is a movie with three like movie stars. They're right, not right. going to actually go filming in some tight space in an actual right. a- apartment, no matter how big it is. That's not what happens in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And I mean, so I guess we are kind of cheating because it doesn't take place in Hollywood. <laughs> Although it's Hollywood it movie and Hollywood of, actors. It is right. of Hollywood. Right. So actually what we're seeing in the movie, what appears to be a little boy is actually, you are actually seeing a face. The ghost of a grown boy? No, no, no. It's not a ghost at all. But you are actually seeing a face. It's not just the pareidolia where you're like, oh, I see someone there, but there's no one there. What you're actually seeing is a cardboard cutout of Ted Danson in like a tuxedo and a top hat. I know it seems kind of strange to have, you know, this cardboard cutout of one of the actors in the film be hiding behind a curtain in an apartment starring that actor. Yeah, like was it a mistake in the making of the movie then? No, kind no, kind of, but no. So in the movie, Ted Danson plays an actor and he's apparently very full of himself. And in fact, 
in the the little clip that we watched today, Vince, where his mom comes over and sees the baby, if you really pay attention in the background, you see in a couple of places where he's got pictures of himself hung up on the wall. And I did see it looked like a, a clipping, a magazine clipping or something, where it looked like a picture of Ted Danson in a top hat in this article that was hung up on the wall. So he had these images of himself plastered all over his apartment. Well, I know if I looked like Ted Danson, I would have lots of mirrors in the house and lots of photographs oh. of myself all over the Ooh, place. Vince has a hot for Ted Danson. That's that's cool. So uh, I guess there was a scene or a whole plot line that was removed from the movie where Ted Danson had this cardboard cutout of himself for some reason. I haven't seen it. It's a, it's a deleted scene. He was in some dog food commercial, I guess, and the cardboard cutout had to do with the dog food commercial, and he brought it home, and he had it, like, hanging out in his apartment. And so I guess if the scene were still in the movie, it would make more sense to see this this cardboard cutout in there, which is why they weren't trying to hide it. It was part of the movie, but that part ended up getting cut out. And you can see all of the the stills from the movie on our website. So you can go there. We will have in that article, not only are there still images where you can see the the cardboard cutout and the the shots of the quote unquote ghost in the window, but we'll also have a link to a YouTube video that kind of breaks it down and shows it a little more close up. So you can check that out for yourself. Can we have a photo gallery of Ted Danson? Also, just so we can get you into can it. just do a Google image search on your free time. Okay, leave me out of this. You know, there are other movies we tried to we actually originally wanted to do this episode about ghosts that show up unexpectedly in movies. But it was surprisingly so hard to find good information on on those kinds of things occurring. It seems like these days, every time a horror movie is made, they come out and they're like, well, this production was cursed. Of course it was, because you're trying to interest people into watching your movie. That worked for, you know, early films, like the first time it happened, but now it doesn't work. You tell me your movie's haunted, I probably don't believe you. The one that really gets me, though, is poltergeist there were there was a lot of tra of tragedy surrounding yeah. that dominique dunn was was murdered by her boyfriend mm -hmm. shortly after I, I i think she she had already died when the movie came out yeah um heather o'rourke the little girl caroline in the movie, she yeah. she died of an illness when she was about 12 years old and those two tragedies are terrible but you can't say that the movie was cursed because you've got joe beth williams and Craig T. Nelson, they're still alive. And they went on and had had really fruitful careers. And so you can't really say that the movie was was uh, cursed. Can I give you just, I just want to drop a little poltergeist trivia on you here. Yeah. You may not know this. Somebody listening may not know this. You know the scene with the pool where Joe Beth Williams is like freaking out and the, the pool is filling up with water and there's skeletons popping up all over the place? Right. Did you know that those were real skeletons? And she didn't know that. Oh, I thought that she knew that and that's why she was screaming. Mm-mm. I don't think so. Yeah, they were real bodies. Oh, well, I just I just always assumed that when you've got a hundred million dollar budget for a movie that you can afford to have some fake skeletons and yeah. have to actually go grave robbing. Yeah, it's pretty grim. But that's a whole nother that's a whole nother rabbit hole and I think that Uh oh. Do you, uh, see, I told you. There it is again. We're button up against time. Yep, there it is. The music turned on. That means we have to be done. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us on this episode number 18 of the Castle of the Spirits podcast. That's right. Where thank we have you. hopefully introduced you to some creepy things that you can maybe go and fall down your own rabbit hole. If you guys know of any other Hollywood hauntings or any other cursed things of or this- just any topics at all that you want us to cover, any of that, you can jump on over to castleofspirits.com slash lounge. Is that what you were going to say, Vince? I was just, just going to say, shoot totally us Totally railroaded you. I was going to say, contact us and let us know. Yeah. Castleofspirits.com slash lounge. And, you know, give us your suggestions and we will keep them on a list and 
see what we can come up with. And if you have any experience with any of the hauntings that we spoke about today, we would love to hear what you've got to tell us. We are here for all of it, friends. We are down, as the kids say. We are down. Down to clown or down to ghost. We're host to ghost. What is Hosts to ghost. I don't know what we're saying anymore. I'm a little punchy. Cheers uh, for fears. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Cheers for fears. And so we will see you in a couple of days with a, another extra sode. So submit your stories. Castlespirits.com slash submit. Because maybe we will read it on a future extra sode. Say goodnight, Vince. Goodnight, Vince. <laughs>